So today I'm going to be talking about with my uh, colleague um, Stefan Slater, feature engineering, better, more interpretable models. And I've got the chat window open. Feel free to interrupt me as I go. I like being interrupted. It makes me feel like people are actually listening. So today we're going to discuss how to engineer features for building and validating prediction models or inferential models for learning analytics. Um, and these are models that infer some predicted variable from predictor variables. Nothing particularly fancy. Uh, your, your model that infers, is a student going to drop out? Or is a student bored? Or is a student uh, going to get a great grade? <clears throat> um, feature engineering <clears throat> is more than just throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks, um, <clears throat> although that is a fine thing to do. Um, before we get started on talking about how to do feature engineering, I thought I would ask the question, why not just use magical deep learning? Because after all, it's magical. And we all know that deep learning can do anything. And um, if you need the computer to, when the student is in trouble, have the jack of spades pop out of the computer, you didn't even know you were playing cards, and squirt cider in your ear, deep learning can do it. So why not just use that? Well, my answer for that, and I'm glad you liked the question. <clears throat> my answer for that is deep learning is pretty good at producing models with very high goodness of fit. But it's not always true for smaller data sets where overfitting is more of a risk. You know, the more flexibility of fit your modeling approach has, the more risk you have of overfitting. <clears throat> and deep learning fits pretty tightly. Um, also, despite recent progress, and there has been a lot of work on interpretable uh, AI focused on uh, deep learning. Deep learning models are harder to inspect and understand. And in some cases, simpler human interpretable models are also more generalizable. Uh, Luke Paquette's work, which I really like, looks at um, using models developed using um, <clears throat> knowledge engineering, which is a step further even than feature engineering, and showing that he can build a model in one learning system, Cognitutor, make it work in another learning system, uh, assessments. So deep learning is great. I, I don't want to challenge the, uh, f the many fans of deep learning, but it's not always the best solution to every problem. And in fact, actually, my lab has had a couple cases where we've tried uh, various, in partnership with various folks who know about deep learning, we've tried uh, kind of John Henry kind of studies where we try feature engineering, deep learning. We typically find that they actually, when you really put the energy into feature engineering, you're not seeing that big a difference in most of those cases. Or when you are seeing the bigger differences, um, and again, this is for problems like affect detection, oftentimes there are questions of generalizability, or in the case like deep knowledge tracing, uh, there can be cases of degeneracy. <clears throat> Happy to chat about that later. But instead of spending the whole time talking about why I don't yet use deep learning for everything, I think I'd like to talk about feature engineering. Feature engineering is the art of creating predictor variables. So where do predictor variables come from, right? You know, when you're using a machine learning algorithm in Python or SAS Enterprise Miner or R or Rapid Miner or Weka, you know, you, you, um, you have this label you're trying to predict and you have these uh, variables that you're predicting it from. And where do those variables come from? Because a lot of the time, <clears throat> especially if we're dealing with adaptive learning data, we don't have anything that looks remotely like the richness of the eventual predictor variables. We just have like right and wrong and timings. Maybe if they asked a hint. So do the predictor variables fall out of the sky? Man, I, I wish they did. Uh, do they come from the Office for Predictor Variables in Washington, DC? Be nice if we could get that. Um, unfortunately, they don't come from either of these things. We have to build them. And feature engineering remains an art. It's a design process. It involves lore rather than well-known and validated design principles. Um, I mean, there's a lot of work in design in various fields to create principles for the good design of environments or uh, design patterns. But our, you know, ultimately, design remains still something where there's a lot of human creativity. And that's true of feature engineering, too. It's hard. It's surprisingly poorly studied and documented. Um, whether we're looking at machine learning more broadly or uh, educational data mining learning analytics, the number of papers you can find on this topic is pretty small. The big idea of this is 
how can we take the voluminous, ill-formed, but at the same time underspecified data that we now have in education and shape it into a reasonable set of variables in an efficient, effective, and predictive way. So before we think of how we make features, let's start with uh, something from your introductory philosophy class and say, what's a good feature? Well, a feature is good if it's potentially meaningfully linked to the construct you want to identify. So I'm making a strong point here. It's not that you can just take a bunch of garbage variables and get a good model. I mean, you can if you don't cross validate, but it's um, that it has to have some meaningful link if it's likely to actually be predictive. <clears throat> we may not always understand that link perfectly, but it has to be something. To put another way, we want features that are effective, but we also don't want features that are tautological. <clears throat> Tautologies don't help us. <clears throat> so, Tautologies, predicting final course grade from the grades on all the assignments and tests. If you can't get an amazing model doing that, there's something deeply wrong. In fact, Wolf et al. 2013 actually tried that and had it not work perfectly, and there was something deeply wrong in their context. So in some ways, a tautology is only good if it fails. Predicting that students who've engaged in violence will engage in violence. It might be true. It'll get you a model with really good numbers, but you don't need a machine learned model to say that students who have already gotten into one knife fight at school are gonna get into another knife fight at school. And we don't need a predictive model to say you gotta do something to support that kid. Predicting that students who stop participating in a course are likely to drop out. Kind of every MOOC stop out model ever, right? Like they're all about that. Like, well, if the student stops participating in week three, I don't think they're going to complete all eight weeks. Again, it's not wrong. You're going to get good prediction from it, but you're not going to learn anything that you can use to do an intervention particularly. Uh, I mean, maybe you're a little more in the stop participating case <clears throat> than the um, engage in violence, engage in violence case, but still, ultimately, when the student stops participating, we know there's a problem. And part of the point of machine learning and data mining and predictive analytics more generally should be to find cases where it's not immediately obvious that there's a problem. That said, one person's silly tautology is another person's reasonable finding. We don't always all look at things the same way. My colleagues and I got written up in the Annals of Improbable Research a few years ago. If you don't know what that is, it's a uh, journal devoted to making fun of scientific research both by publishing parody papers, which I have done a couple of, and uh, making fun of people's research that they think is bad, which I have also been written up for. So I'm, I'm not sure, but I may be one of the few people to, to be in that journal for both reasons. We'd publish a paper finding that confusion and boredom during programming assignments was associated with worse midterm performance. So if you got confused or bored when you were doing your assignments, you did worse on the midterm. And we were the subject of a sarcastic write-up that caused the first author to get brought in and yelled at by a senior official at her university for bringing shame on the university for generations to come. <clears throat> but actually, we thought it was worth publishing because it was the first paper correlating affect during learning to longer-term outcomes, and a year earlier than Peckern. And the paper's point was that frustration was not associated with worse midterm performance, which continued a theme from Craig et al on the inconsistent relationships between frustration and learning, which has actually continued to be a relevant research question in the field even today. Liz Ritchie, uh, I think it's just been published, but Liz Ritchie had a paper on this topic. So, you know, it's funny because in that case, people said it's, a, it's obvious, there's no point to documenting it. <clears throat> and sometimes there is a point to documenting the obvious. And sometimes there's a point to having the obvious in your predictive analytics model. But um, I guess it's a question of, is it useful? What's it useful for? And that's what you've got to be thinking about. So bottom line, what are the goals of your analysis or model? Predicting final course grades from assignments and tests seems like it's silly, but not if you're trying to show that some racial groups get lower grades than they should after controlling for these factors. So, <clears throat> 
I'll pause just a second. I don't see any questions popping in the window. You're welcome to ask questions in the window. Our feature engineering process that we use in the Penn Center for Learning Analytics, we've been using it for a few years. First, we brainstorm features. Second, after doing that, we decide what features to create. I'll talk about why one and two aren't the same thing in just a second. Three, we create the features. Four, we study the impact of the features on our model. Five, we iterate on the features if useful. We go back to creating more features or sometimes we say, oh my gosh, what we've got is terrible. Let's go back and brainstorm more features. So one key point is you don't have to distill all the features at once. And more on this later, but I think this is one of the, um, people tend to have this impression that when you're doing this, you've got to know in advance what all your features are going to be. You got to build them all and you can't ever run a machine learning model until you build them. And there's a reason why people do this. It's the reason why people worry about this. You know, in statistics land, running some analyses, and then you find something and you run some more analyses. And then you run some more analyses and you keep drilling until the data tells you something. And then you use a P of 0.05 criterion on everything you did as if you hadn't just run 19 tests. That's a sin in statistics land. There's a reason why people don't want people to do stuff. Why, why your statistics professor told you not to do that kind of stuff. Um, but this is a different paradigm. And especially if you've held out a test set the whole way through, or better yet, you're gonna go collect a new test set as soon as you finish building your model, then there's nothing wrong with it. I like, by the way, this is a bit of a digression. So I apologize. I like the paradigm of collect an entirely new test set after you finish building the model and publish it even more than I like holding out a test at the entire time. And the reason is because you can't cheat. I mean, you can tell the world that you held out that test set from the very beginning. You can tell the world you never looked at it. And, you know, you, you, we're all honest people here. We're all uh, learning analytics people. We're known for our honesty, but you can't really prove that you're being honest. But when you publish the model before you collect the new data, it's really hard to cheat. You can only cheat if you have a time machine and mine's broken. So anyways, moving on. Thank you, George, for your backup on my claim that learning analytics people are among the most moral. I thoroughly agree. If we weren't deeply concerned about making the world better, surely we could find an area of analytics and data mining that makes more money. So brainstorming features, it can be more or less formal. You know, um, I like IDEO's tips for brainstorming as a guideline. To be really honest, I follow them more often when I'm dealing with a problem I've never seen before than when I'm dealing with a, uh, a problem that's like one we've used a lot. At this point, my lab has built affect detectors over and over and over and over. And we don't need to go through the whole process anymore because we kind of just get lazy and look back at our old notes. But I use these uh, procedures when we're building something new. So principle one, uh, defer judgment. You know, when you're brainstorming, and these are not my rules, these are IDEOs. They're an awesome design firm in the Bay Area. Built all kinds of cool stuff like those fancy shopping carts you see at Whole Foods. Um, first of all, defer judgment. Um, don't say to your teammates, oh, that's a stupid idea, while you're brainstorming. Say it to them after you're done brainstorming. Encourage wild ideas. Again, same point. Don't say it's stupid until after you're done brainstorming. Build on the ideas of others. You know, if you're just gonna like stay in your own little bubble while you're brainstorming other people, you might as well save the trouble of getting out of your coronavirus bubble to meet with them or getting on Zoom. Just do it by yourself. The whole point of group brainstorming is to, is to build off each other. You know, George may have a great idea, and after Justin's gotten his hands on it, it's an even better idea. Stay focused on the topic. I have to have a rule about that. And those of you who watched the last 15 minutes of me talk know why. Um, one conversation at a time. You know, um, that can, you know, if you've got some idea that you're just in love with, 
and you want to talk, just take a note and hold off on it because uh, when you start having 17 conversations among 18 people, you, start, you lose the benefit of group brainstorming. Be visual. A little harder to do now in the era of uh, COVID and Zoom. I mean, there are such things as interactive whiteboards and you can take notes. How many of you actually do this, right? Like you take notes on paper during a meeting, probably not at this angle. Go for quantity. You don't wanna be judging yourself too much. You wanna come up with as many ideas as possible during brainstorming and then throw them out. You know, you can filter later but you'll, you might only get to the really great ideas if you allow yourself to write out a whole lot. When we do this, and it's a practice I recommend, it's good to have both learning analytics experts and domain experts in the room. Domain experts, people who understand the literature in the area you're trying to model. If there's any such literature, usually there is. By, especially by now, usually there's something worth reading. People who've uh, watched someone do the behavior you're interested in, for example. So if I'm working on modeling affect or disengaged behavior or self-regulated learning behavior, um, people who've actually like watched somebody in the field do it are good people to have in a brainstorm session. Or if we annotate uh, log files, a little more common, a little easier to do these days, um, then uh, people who've done that annotation. <clears throat> People who've taught relevant to the construct you're interested in. If you've got some like, you know, domain construct that you're trying to model, like computational thinking or Newton's laws, people who've actually taught that probably will have a deeper understanding of how the behavior manifests itself. There is no substitute for getting teachers in your brainstorming sessions, teachers, university instructors, if you feasibly can. They provide such an amazing perspective. <clears throat> Building on the ideas of others. It doesn't just have to be people. You know, I, I posed it like you've got this brainstorming session where you get together the members of your lab with pizza and beer and um, face masks. Um, and you're all brainstorming together. But it doesn't just have to be people in your brainstorming session, and that includes your Zoom brainstorming session. Um, there's a huge literature out there by now. It's 2020. Um, Medium and lack have been around for years. There's a huge literature out there of features that people have tried that have worked or failed to work for a range of problems. Um, read papers from researchers working on similar problems and see what you can use. And some folks have even tried crowdsourcing. Um, and that's kind of cool. <clears throat> you know, if you've got something where crowdsourcing is plausible, it's more plausible for some things than others. Um, in cases where people kind of, where there's lots of people who can understand what you're talking about, it makes a lot of sense. On hard projects, my research group, as I mentioned a minute ago, meets sometimes as a team over pizza and beer to brainstorm. And obviously we're not doing that right now. Um, but you know, the days of pizza and beer will come back and uh, I've been ordering uh, enough from my favorite uh, Philadelphia pizzeria that they're still in business and I've gained 20 pounds. Um, on easier projects, what we'll do is that one person will brainstorm by themselves. Um, and then what they'll do is they'll discuss their features with another person who will offer further suggestions. So we kind of get some of the building back and forth through that process while not needing the whole team. Over time, like I mentioned, more of our projects will become easy projects. We just have more experience doing this and we have more literature out there to build off of. By the way, I made a joke about pizza, but I'm gonna make a serious statement about beer. For those of you who aren't morally or uh, physically opposed to drinking, it can be a pretty useful thing. Um, having a drink often loosens up the mind a little bit. Having three drinks is less productive, but you know, a beer is not a bad idea and I'm happy to spring for a six pack or a 20 pack for the lab. <clears throat> so, okay, you've brainstormed. <clears throat> You've got your list of 600 features and you don't want to build 600 features because that's crazy. There's never infinite time. Um, even in coronavirus era where I don't have to like drive to work or shower or any of those things that used to be necessary. Um, I'm joking. Um, 
there's still never infinite time. There's a trade-off between the effort to create a feature and how likely it is to be useful. Um, and how likely it is to be useful? I mean, obviously, you can't know how useful it will really be because you have to actually build the feature and that would miss the point of studying whether you need to build the feature. But you can look at whether similar features have been useful for similar problems and you can use your own best intuition. And your intuition doesn't have to be very good because you gotta start somewhere. <clears throat> While you're doing that, it's also worth biasing in favor of features that are different than anything else you've ever tried before. Um, so what do I mean by that? I mean, if you've got a feature in your model, did the student make an action in under 60 seconds? It's probably not good to make another feature. Did they make an action under 40 seconds? And under 45 seconds? And under 90 seconds? And under 93 seconds? I mean, that's easy, <clears throat> but that's a good way to kind of not get much bang for your time. Like, what's better is that if you've got a feature of one type already in your model, try something totally different. Now, there is a time for iterating on the features that are really good, but maybe it's not early in the process. Once you have built a model and you know that 90 seconds is good, then you might want to try features that are related. But in this early stage, we've just brainstormed. Now we're deciding what to do. You want to, your best bet is to come up with a set of features to build that is tractable and different from each other. <clears throat> so, okay, you've brainstorm your features. You've got a first pass sense of what features you want to create. How do you create them? Well, it is the year 2020, and I'm reluctant to tell anyone to go against fashion and use anything but Python or Jupyter because, man, I've been heckled for saying people should use Excel. But I'm going to go ahead and still do it. If you're an Excel user, Excel is a really awesome feature prototyping tool. I'm not saying build your features for 6 million data points in Excel, but Taking Excel and building your features for a couple thousand data points just to kind of get it going. Thank you, Adriana. I appreciate that. Um, building your features for a few thousand data points in Excel can be really useful because it can reduce your probability of making mistakes and implementing different features than the ones you meant to. It's really easy when you write code to kind of get an output in the end and it looks basically non-crazy, so you run with it. And you only find out much later that it's not at all what you meant to make. I've seen that happen. <clears throat> if I had a dollar for every time I'd see that happen, I would at least have money to buy myself a pizza from my favorite Philadelphia pizzeria. So um, it's really great. Now, it's a funny thing, actually. Sometimes the features you make accidentally turn out to be really fantastic. I've had that happen more than once. but. Still, your goal is ultimately to make the features you mean to make. So Excel can be a really good tool for seeing intermediates. I, I haven't come across anything. I don't think that uh, Jupyter Notebooks um, are as good for that. They're really good for exploring your data kind of in an ongoing fashion, but not for step-by-step uh, step step feature engineering. And OpenRefine, if there's anybody still using OpenRefine, it's funny, it just isn't as good as Excel and nor is Google Sheets for this specific point. <laughs> I, I still use Excel. I used Excel uh, this morning, about 11 a.m. So, okay. I hear you all cry. What are some features I should be thinking about? There's a bunch. Let me say a few, that, a few kind of things that we find useful. Aggregating from finer grain to coarse grain. So why would you want to do that? Well, um, I appreciate that. Yeah, it, it was about 11, maybe 11, 15. Um, so this happens in a lot of models because a lot of times you have fine grained data to predict from and you want to predict something that's coarse grained. For example, you want to predict whether somebody's going to drop out of high school. That's pretty coarse grained. They're only going to drop out of high school once, probably. Um, but there's like literally thousands or tens of thousands of things that lead up to that. Um, even if you're predicting fine-grained like affect. Affect is typically recognized like in 20 second blocks. Um, the actions you have in your learning system often are finer grain than 20 seconds. So it's common to have to aggregate from finer grain to coarser grain. And 
you know, hey, you'll probably notice this from Excel pivot tables, things Excel pivot tables like to do. You can get a count of how many times something occurs during your course or period. You can take an average of the variable. You can take the standard deviation, the minimum or maximum. I end up using each of these a lot. They're all good. <clears throat> count so far. Man, that shows up in so many models. So like, how many times has a student asked for a hint on this skill? How many times has a student played a game? How many times has a student uh, quit a video in the middle? How many times has a student um, been suspended from school? How many times has the student gotten a C on an assignment? There's all kinds of things that if you're looking at a specific moment, you want to count up to. You also might want to count not just so far, but in the last N actions or last period of time. So of the last five actions, how many of them did the student request a hint on? Of the last three videos, how many did the student quit early on? Um, of the last month, how many times did the student get in trouble? <clears throat> Differentiating first and subsequent attempts. In learning systems that allow multiple attempts at content, oftentimes the first one is very different from the subsequent ones. And that, that's not a discovery from, from me. Um, the first model I know of in my head that does this is Bayesian knowledge tracing, which dates back to the mid 90s, back when I was still in high school. Um, Bayesian knowledge tracing um, says that it counts more if it's your first attempt at a problem than your later ones. <clears throat> we found since then as a field that there are some cases where uh, later actions in a sequence also tell you something. So if you get something wrong on the 17th try, it tells you something very different than if you get it wrong on the first try. <clears throat> Interestingly, second through nth seems to fit together more than first does with second, for whatever reason. <clears throat> That's true across a lot of problems. Ratios between events of interest. Um, what's the ratio between quitting a video and attempting an assignment? What's the ratio between uh, getting a good grade and getting a bad grade? All kinds of ratios turn out to be relevant. Percentage of, the action, of an action type so far. How many of the students, um, how many of the math problems the student encountered did they ask for a hint on? Um, how many times did the student play a game or dress up their avatar rather than trying to learn? Um, it can be a proportion of time too. Um, like what proportion of time has the student spent watching videos? Uh, what proportion of the time is the student uh, spent on a specific type of action or a specific location? Um, Felden and Kafai's work years ago showing that students in Wyville, I think it was spent 60% of their time dressing up their avatars and 40% of their time on all other activities, including learning combined. Percentage of time spent on a specific knowledge component or skill. If a student spends 70% of their time on one skill this month, um, either, either that's something you expected and knew about, or there's something weird going on. Did an event of interest ever occur for a student? Um, you know, sometimes there's just a specific event that is really important and interesting. Like, I don't know, um, a suspension. One suspension from school tells you a lot about a student. Um, students are at much higher risk. I probably shouldn't admit to all of these people here that I've been suspended. For, I was suspended from school back in high school. So probably tells you something. Number of times something happened so far. Comparing earlier behaviors to later behaviors through caching. I love this one. Like, is a student getting faster at responding over time? Um, is a student uh, becoming less serious over time? You know, if you take two students and actually let's say, I see Alex Bowers on this call. Let me give an example from Alex's work. A student whose performance is low um, in say upper elementary or middle school it means very, something very different for their risk of dropping out of high school, depending on whether they started out low and stayed low or started out higher and dropped. In fact, kind of counterintuitively, if you're just saying the higher the average grade, the better, start up high and dropped is actually uh, associated with worse outcomes than started low and stayed low. <clears throat> unitization. I love unitization. 
standard deviations above or below the mean. So, <clears throat> for example, <clears throat> if a student takes 20 seconds to input an answer, and the average student takes four minutes to input an answer, then 20 seconds is crazy fast. But if they take 20 seconds to enter an answer, and the average answer is three seconds, then it's quite slow. Um, so taking means and standard deviations and interpreting a specific action in terms of that can tell you a lot more than just absolute times. And it can also increase your model's generalizability. If you have a model that's based on students taking 72 seconds on learning resource XQFTR, that model is not going to work once the learning resource XQFTR is gone. Even if it's just 72 seconds or more, if you switch to a learning environment where actions are much slower or much faster, suddenly that model kind of breaks. Now, there's a lot of um, means and standard deviations you can take. You can look across students in any situation. Well, honestly, I don't really know why you'd bother with that one for most cases. You can look across students in the same situation, which might mean uh, the same knowledge component or skill or the same video, right? Like, um, if you're trying to decide whether people are watching uh, videos for long enough, it matters whether, how long the video is. You can also look across the same student in different situations so far. If you've got a student who's usually working quickly and suddenly they're working very slowly, it might mean something different than a student who frequently works slowly. So, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so, iterating on a feature. Back in step two, uh, you remember step two? Back in step two, when you're saying what features to make, kind of on your first pass, you probably want to pick features that are pretty different from each other. But once you've kind of created some features, you've built the model, you've tested them out, you found that 72 seconds is a really good, 70 seconds is a really great feature, then like I mentioned before, try close variance. Try, you know, you can um, even do a, a grid search uh, where you just try 71, 72, 73, 74, 75. Or you can do an iterative gradient descent um, to kind of get the optimal feature values. Um, credit where credit's due. The first time I saw this done in education was Edo Roll at the University of British Columbia. I think it's a nice idea at the right phase in the feature engineering process. <clears throat> so example, you know, you have a feature slow actions after hints, she, Katinger, and shyness, 2008. And you define slow action as an action taking over 20 seconds. Well, it works, but maybe you'd get an even better model if you tried 30 seconds. And I think I actually talked about this, but a second ago, so I kind of anticipated my own slides, but you know, you can do this by hand, hand works. You can use the Excel equation solver. Um, that doesn't work so well if the function gets complex. Um, you can do a grid search. That's how, uh, my Bayesian knowledge tracing package, BKTBF, actually works. Uh, you can use a gradient descent algorithm in Python or your favorite tool. Um, <clears throat> these days, gradient descent algorithms are a lot better than they used to be. Andrew only says downhill simplex can be, can be good if gradients aren't available, and I totally agree. You're right. Just a straight hill climb can be great, too. I mean, you can knock yourself out, right? You can use genetic algorithms or, uh, or simulated annealing. Frequently, that's overkill for this kind of problem, though. I don't, I've only seen, I think, one, one case that used simulated annealing in our field. Sorry, Andrew, actually, Andrew's saying the opposite, by the way, of the ramble I just gave. Downhill simplex is simpler than gradient descent. The things I talked about were fancier. But point is, lots of options. Thank you, Andrew. <clears throat> Details of features matter. Yes, you're right. Andrew. Details of features matter. For example, the same feature can have a different impact based on context. And I got a fun example for that. Baker, uh, Lindrum, Perkowski, and Lindrum, 2015. Um, my second or third favorite paper title I've been, a list of authors I've been involved in. Um, whether a student has opened their e-textbook predicts whether they fail the course. That is true throughout the course. But with totally different precision and recall and totally different semantics on the first day of class versus the seventh day of class. So if you can see this here, on day zero of class, so 
the sheer fact that the student hasn't opened the textbook yet on the first day of class actually is predictive of whether they're going to fail the class. The recall is quite good. 70% of students who eventually fail the class haven't yet opened the textbook, but the precision, not fantastic, less than half. So there's a lot of students who haven't opened the textbook yet who are still going to pass the class. By day seven, the properties have changed a bunch. At this point, the precision has gone up to about 75%, but the recall has dropped to 20%. So if you haven't opened the textbook yet after a week of class, you're pretty likely to be in trouble. But a lot of people are in trouble who have by now opened the textbook. And you can see that the curve actually continues on to 14 days. At 14 days, um, if you haven't opened the textbook yet, at 14 days, you're kind of doomed, at least in the classes we studied. On the other hand, if you haven't opened the textbook yet by day negative seven, um, well, it's catching pretty much everybody who's going to drop the course, but the precision has dropped further. Surprisingly, still not to zero. But that's actually because um, there are a certain proportion of students who are going to fail the course. <clears throat> so, okay, you have brains from your feature set. You've got a, you, sorry, you have brains from your feature set. You have decided which ones to create. You've created those features. You've built those features. You've put them into practice. You've tested them. Now you want to iterate your feature set. And for how to iterate your feature set, there's some uh, new and breaking work in our lab that I would like to introduce uh, Stefan Slater to talk about. So, Stefan, uh, do you want to share your screen or do you want to bleep at me? I don't think I have a local copy of this, so I'm just going to next slide you if that's okay. You got it. Cool. Um, next slide. Oh, wait, no, I'm full screen now. Hang on. Uh, all right, there we go. So earlier, uh, Ryan showed a slide that looked a little something like this, where we kind of listed out what the process is for feature engineering. We start with brainstorming. We move on to deciding what features we create. We build them. We see if the model's any good. And then if we have good features in it, we iterate on them. We see if we can make them a bit better. We kind of do that uh, as a cycle. Um, but there's another way that we can do this. And if you want to hit next slide, uh, what we can do is, uh, my video, I don't have video. I'm waiting for the, uh, the COVID webcam price spike to go down. So I don't have a, a face to share right now, unfortunately, but hopefully soon, um, as soon as the start of semester panic buying dies down. Um, so fundamentally, Feature engineering relies on shaping your data into variables. You're trying to build out contextual information about what it is that your students are doing in whatever system you're studying. You're trying to figure out uh, what data matters, what's important, what's not important. Um, if you want to next slide me. So if your features aren't working, how do you decide how to iterate? If you've got a model and you plug all your new and fancy exciting features into it and your performance isn't really what you expected, um, where do you go from there? What are your next steps? How do you continue that iteration cycle? Next. You can either go back to the brainstorming iteration phase, like in Ryan's schedule, or you can cheat a little bit. So. Once you've modeled and you have goodness of fit, you can make a confusion matrix. And a confusion matrix is a two by two matrix comparing what your model predicts to what actually happens. And you get four different kinds of values out of this. When your ground truth and your model agree, you have true positives. A thing happened and your model predicted the thing was going to happen. When you have something that didn't happen in your ground truth and your model predicts that successfully, you have a true negative. Your model said it wasn't going to happen and it didn't actually happen. And then you've got your two interesting cases. You have cases where your model predicts that something is going to happen, but the ground truth is that nothing actually happened there. You have a false positive. Your model thinks that something was going to happen, but it didn't actually happen. And then you also have false negatives, cases where your phenomenon actually exists in your ground truth, the thing actually happened, but your model wasn't able to predict it. 
And so we've highlighted those two those two uh, cells here on this next slide. And you can probably just skip right past it. Yeah, so if you want to go back one. So this is where our room for improvement lies. If we want to take a model, we want to make it better, doing features that are better in the true positive and true negative case isn't really going to do anything. We want to drill down into the cases where our model doesn't agree with the ground truth, and we want to know what's happening in those cases. So in the case where a student does the thing that we're trying to predict. A student drops out from the class and the model was like, I didn't expect that at all. I can't believe that would happen. Or the case where the model says that a student is absolutely going to drop out and they carry through the entire class. Those are the cases where we can pick up performance increases. And so what if after our first round of feature engineering, we actually just subsampled those cases and we just looked at them and we said, what is going on in here? What did this student do? What features can we build out of these specific cases in order to improve our model performance? And so we tried this and you can see the results of us trying this on the next slide here with a couple caveats that we're going to be presenting on afterwards. So this is some work that we did in Physics Playground. Physics Playground is an educational physics simulation game developed by Valerie Shute at Florida State University. Physics Playground involves moving a, a green ball to a red balloon somewhere else in the level by using different physics concepts. So you draw simple machines like levers, pendulums, springboards. And for about the last year and a half, we've been trying to predict when students quit out of a level in Physics Playground. When they say, this is too hard, or I'm bored of this, or I don't wanna do this anymore. And they leave without completing a level successfully and they go play a different level in the game. So we've got three different graphs here. In blue, we have the original model that we built, which we used, uh, Ryan, your original kind of schema for, where we brainstormed some features, we looked at previous literature, uh, and we said, these are features that seem to be important in Physics Playground. Let's build these, and let's fit a model. And we got an AUC of 0.688 out of that. And then what we did, is we took that model, we took all the cases that were either uh, false positive or false negative, and I did basically qualitative coding of them. I opened the cases up in Excel, the actual log data, and I just read through them to see what students did. So that log data would look something like uh, the level initializes, the student draws a machine, the machine gets identified, a student erases that machine, draws another machine, and then solves the level successfully. And for each of those, we have timestamps, we have contextual information about what level they're on, um, what kind of machine they're drawing, how long it took them to draw these machines, and all this kind of stuff. And so based on just reading through those and doing uh, qualitative analyses, we built out a bunch of new features. Uh, and the new model that we built out of that gave us an AUC of 0.812 over 0.688. That's the graph in yellow. Um, and Adriana, you're absolutely right that we have uh, a major risk of overfitting with this. If you want to move to the next slide, Ryan. Because basically what we're doing is we are taking the local data that we have and we're saying, what are the things that these local students did? and we're just feeding them back into the model directly. Um, and so since we actually put this presentation together, Ryan and I have gotten a new data set from a uh, physics playground that was collected on another set of 300 or so students. And we tried applying this model and the, the two models perform about the same now with the old features and with the new features although there were a bunch of changes that were made in the game itself in terms of the way that students interact with the system. There was a whole new set of levels that were added that used new machine types that weren't in the older game. And so we're not exactly sure how bad the overfitting process is. Um, I've looked at some of the features 
specifically to see kind of like what's getting carried through the model and do the iteratively engineered features actually carry through into new iterations of the data. And a couple of them do. So a couple of them seem like they generalize well, but a couple of them uh, vanish almost entirely from the model where they just don't predict anything anymore. And so one of the things that we're really interested in looking at is when you're doing this, uh, is there a way that you can engineer your features specifically, possibly by avoiding an over-reliance on cutoffs or an over-reliance on uh, especially rare actions that students take that seem to be especially predictive uh, that might help us fix some of these overfitting issues. But we're not exactly sure right now just because of the major contextual differences that we had in between these two data sets in Physics Playground. Um, and it's also just not going to fix bad data, right? If you have data that just isn't very contextually rich or doesn't have very good timestamp resolution or just doesn't have a lot of information on what students are doing, um, it's, it's not going to fix that issue. Uh, other questions before we move on? All right, I think we can next slide then. Yeah, so some potential applications of this, uh, it lets you split your data into groups of interest and it lets you feature engineer on specific subgroups. So one of the things that we've found with our work on affect detectors in Ryan's lab is that students in rural, suburban and urban areas um, have a different set of features that predicts the affect that students are experiencing at any given time in a tutoring system. And so if you suspect that there are differences among different subgroups in your data, differences between men and women, differences between age groups, differences between socioeconomic status or ethnicity, or differences between high and low performers, you can engineer features specifically for that subgroup that you want to improve performance on by subselecting them and modeling each subgroup and then iteratively engineering features for the groups where your model underperforms. And then I think after that, we're back to you, Ryan. So any last questions on um, our iterative feature engineering process that we've applied here? It's still, it, I think, Ryan, one of our goals here in the near future is to find some better data sets to replicate it on, ones where the underlying data isn't changing so severely from training set to test set. So it would actually be really helpful if anyone in call has a data set that they kind of want to try and workshop this on so that we can get a better an handle on whether we are just doing 100% overfitting or whether you're actually able to boost model performance a bit uh, by employing this method. And you can reach out to either Ryan or myself um, digitally through our, through our inboxes if you have a data set that might be interesting for us to use for that. Wonderful. Thank you, Stefan. And um, in case that you have any difficulty finding our email addresses, um, Google, uh, in my case, at least Google Ryan Baker. I'm not the Miami Dolphins linebacker, if that helps you. Um, so my see. top hit for me, I'm not sure if it's different for other people, is my Google Scholar page. And then after that is my LinkedIn. And then after that is my personal site. So those should all be correct. Very good. So Andrew, thanks for coming and thank the rest of you for staying. Um, so, okay, um, that was great, Stefan, thank you. And uh, <laughs> thanks, George. Um, so a uh, few more issues to talk about. Data cleaning, AKA outlier handling. So data cleaning is like a really big key thing in statistics where outliers can skew your means and your standard deviations and wreck your distributions. One outlier can turn an effect into a non-effect, or vice versa. Um, it's still a thing in data mining where values can, can be wrong or misleading. Um, there's a lot of ways to identify outliers in your features. So theoretical approaches. Students use this software during 45 minute class periods. I see a two, 972 minute period of time taken to make a response. Something must have gone wrong here. Now it's, it's important to distinguish between um, 
cases that seem wrong and cases that have to be wrong. This is a case that has to be wrong. Negative time is another case that has to be wrong. Just um, in a MOOC, 972 minutes seems wrong, but it doesn't have to be wrong. It's not impossible that the student really could have like been, I don't know, working on the assignment for 972 minutes. Um, I mean, surely all of us have had like 16 hour work days before. Theoretical approaches um, can capture meaningful changes in a feature semantics. So this is an example where it just looks broken. But if you have values that are out of bounds and it happens a lot, you have to ask yourself, does this feature even mean what I think it should mean? Another way to do this is deviation based approaches. So all data that's three standard deviations over or three standard deviations under the mean, we're gonna treat it as an outlier. This is faster and easier to do. It doesn't leverage understanding. There might be a legitimate reason why some people are three standard deviations over the mean. Also, uh, if your data is, I don't know, bimodal, then the mean doesn't mean very much, right? Like um, shoe size in uh, human adults, I believe is bimodal because men and women have such different shoe sizes that there's like two peaks. So this kind of, uh, kind of more deviation-based approach makes more sense when your data really fits a bell curve. And a lot of data in the world doesn't. <clears throat> what do you do when you found an outlier? You can do truncation. You can just delete those cases. Um, you can Windsorize. You can set the data value to the cutoff value. So if you want to say that no data point should be more than three standard deviations off the mean, um, then you can just say, well, anything that's beyond that is we're going to treat it like it's exactly three standard deviations off the mean. That can have the benefit of not getting rid of data that you don't want to get rid of, but it also can lead to weird results where you have a lot of clumping right at your very extreme edges. You could also do nothing. Which one should you choose? Well, it depends on what kind of model you're using. Linear and logistic regression are more vulnerable to extreme values than trees say. In fact, I know of one case where someone was using random forest and they sent missing data to be negative 600. And that actually turned out to show up in their model a whole bunch because it turned out that one variable being missing actually was meaningful. Also, um, one question is, do you want to keep the outlier in the current feature or make another feature for the outlier? You know, that negative 600 case actually kind of implicitly, implicitly did that, right? But um, another thing you can just say is, I want to have a one zero for whether this is in my outliers. I'll Windsorize it, but also uh, make a special feature just for that. So a few thoughts. And I think that actually Adriana's question kind of presupposed this, it kind of caught on this. Isn't all of this cheating? Or to put it in a more data science-y way, doesn't feature engineering overfit? Well, yeah, it really can. Which is why it's useful to remember that the true test of a model, like I mentioned at the beginning, is whether it works on entirely unseen data. If you iterate a lot and use cross-validated goodness, um, you're gonna get better numbers just by whacking the data too much. So if you iterate a lot, the true test of your model should be at least a held out data set, and better yet, newly collected data later on after you've published the details of your model. Feature engineering. Your features come from somewhere. You can take a standard set of variables. You can take pre-existing variables. You can use deep learning. And there's no question at least that taking a standard set of variables or pre-existing variables is faster. Things like the Pittsburgh Science and Learning Center data shop will give you some standard variables right off the bat these days. But thinking about your variables is likely to lead to better models even within an existing data set. So even if you download an assistance data set from Neil Heffernan's webpage, and it's already got all my feature engineering, I wouldn't stop there. I would think about what you actually want to model, and I would um, um, do some feature engineering. I'm going to take one second because the, uh, suddenly the sun is coming. Eh, I don't think I can actually fix it. I'll be lecturing like this for the rest of the time. Let me see the angle I'm at now. Apologies. I guess that um, the sun changing places during the day is actually a phenomenon. Um, so. One more piece of evidence that theoretically justified thoughtful features actually matter comes from work by Mike Sale Pedro, who got the student best paper at user modeling and adaptive personalization, might have just been called user modeling, back in 2012. So 
Sao Pedro actually took a pre-existing set of variables. Um, he had a domain expert choose which of those were theoretically plausible. And he found that if he biased in favor of this set, in a pretty simple fashion, he was using a feature selection algorithm and he just had it, if things were equal or close enough to equal, just pick the one that was more theoretically plausible. And he showed that this led to models that worked better for new data. There's a lot of ways to implement a preference for, um, for theoretically justified features. You could wait in favor of them, uh, you could select them first, or you could just filter down to them. But it seems at least in that one case to be helpful. No variables at all yet? Build the plausible ones first. You know, so Sao Pedro selected down, but you can also just, when you're deciding what to build, your step two of the process, build those ones first. Um, the comment, there are not many, I said there are not many papers on feature engineering in our discipline, but I'm citing a bunch. Yeah, I guess that's true. But if you compare that, yeah, you got a good point. I guess though, if you compare it to the sheer number of papers that just build a predictive model and don't discuss the feature engineering deeply, they just give a list of features, um, uh, the number is way higher. Right? There's a lot more papers that don't talk about it or think about it. And I guess it's fair to say, I think that there are now probably more papers on deep learning than feature engineering in our field. And deep learning hasn't been around nearly as long. But you're right, there have been some work. I just wish there was more. Yeah, thank you, Stefan, good point. So another way to get features, knowledge engineering. In knowledge engineering, which is a discipline way older than um, educational data mining, learning analytics. In knowledge engineering, a knowledge engineer and a domain expert work together to model a construct. Uh, they go through an iterative process where the knowledge engineer interviews the expert and then they create models and then they go through the model and its implications with the expert. They get feedback uh, they enhance the models and they repeat the process. Um, and they do that until both the knowledge engineer and the domain expert believe the model has fully captured the expert's reasoning process. They both think this is really how I think about things. Now, you can then take the features found during all knowledge engineering and you can combine them, recombine them with machine learning. This is more work than traditional feature engineering but it can lead to better performance on a held on held out data than a more traditionally developed feature set. I don't know actually of any examples of this work in our field except for Paquette's work, but I really, really like Paquette's work. Paquette went through this process studying how a human coder gamed, studied gaming the system, how she identified it, went through multiple rounds of studying her process, built a model around her, and then he took the operators she used and put those into machine learning and let the model recombine them and got some pretty great models. Um, George says, Paquette must have had a great supervisor to earn your respect and you're right. His doctoral advisor, Henri Mayers, was such a smart guy. And I was so delighted to be able to work with someone like Paquette who'd had the opportunity to study um, with Henri. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but thank you, George. So, there's a lot of ways to do this, as I hope you can see. You know, knowledge engineering is one, kind of uh, Stefan's iterative process, um, Sao Pedro's process of using theoretical judgment, our lab's uh, modified ideal process. Um, there's a lot of ways to do this. Uh, Vera Machanani's uh, crowdsourcing process. One bottom line is they're all a lot of work. This is not easy to do, but if you do it right, you get a good model that you can understand and improve on. That's pretty valuable. So thank you all for your time and attention. I'm so delighted to have had an opportunity to uh, speak at the Learning Analytics Learning Network. A quick commercial. Um, first of all, all of our lab's papers are available off our Twitter feed and our Facebook feed. If you follow us, you'll get low traffic, just a couple posts a month, three or four maybe, uh, presenting our latest scientific findings. We won't spam you with our political opinions. Also, all of our lab publications are available online. Google me as previously mentioned. And finally, we have a MOOC, Big Data and Education, 
available on edX. Unlike most edX MOOCs, our MOOC's still free. You can still get a free, uh, you can still take it for completely free as long as you don't want a verified certificate. Um, also, all the videos are up on YouTube. So thank you all for your time and attention. And I'd be glad to answer any more broad questions, any kind of general things or anything else anyone wants to talk about. Great, thanks very much, Ryan. I think you uh, gave us uh, just a really solid overview on uh, the feature engineering process, some of the limitations, some of the opportunities, some of the technologies. So I think a fantastically informative introduction. Um, at this stage, you can either uh, request the mic and I can uh, unmute you or uh, ask your question in the discussion forum. Alternatively, as I mentioned earlier, if you go to the learninganalytics.net slash L-A-L-N link, you will see a link to the Canvas shell where we are sort of hosting the discussion for, for this uh, these particular set of webinars. Feel free to add them there as well. So we'll just give it a minute or so for any questions. If not, we will uh, wrap up a little early. There's a question in the chat, Ryan, if you want to have a run at that. So in the case of unsupervised machine learning, how can we say the impact of features on model goodness? <sighs> that's really hard. And the reason that's really hard is because goodness barely means the same thing in clustering at all. Um, goodness in clustering kind of means how well do your clusters how well do data points fit in your clusters? How good is your clustering scheme having close fit? And that's not, despite the fact that that's how like, that's like everything on how clusters are evaluated, you know, silhouettes about that and BICs about that and deviations about that. But, but it actually isn't the right way to evaluate clusters anyways, because the point of clusters, I think, is not to get a good fit to the data, but to learn something about your data. Um, in order to learn something about your data, you have to have features that are meaningful. If you just plug in features that are bland or pointless, you won't learn anything. Um, but how to measure whether people learn anything is really hard. Um, I'm reminded of, some of you may know of the concept of interestingness in association rule mining, sequential pattern mining. I had a colleague, uh, Diego Luna Basaldua, who, um, who actually said, wait a minute, all these interestingness measures, how do we know they're interesting? And he did this study where he actually asked domain experts, is this finding interesting? And then he looked at what metric predicted what the experts found was interesting. And I thought that paper was super interesting and nobody has cited or used it pretty much ever since. Uh, incidentally, by the way, the answer is Jacquard beats the pants off of more standard interestingness measures. But so I realize there's a long response, Brahim, but I guess, the answer is it's really hard. Um, I would say that the ultimate arbiter in clustering is with your features, do you find clusters that you find interesting or useful and not how good the fit is. Any other questions? I'll, I'll go on the canvas thing for a couple days. Um, just to see if there's any comments or questions, or you can always feel free to email me and Stefan. We usually answer our email eventually. Oh, we have an Alex Bowers question. Um, as in the data set papers that describe the data set and metadata, and there's a big need for that, and boy, I agree with you there. Is there an opportunity for feature engineering papers where the feature engineering is described and that's kind of it? I, if I were a reviewer and the feature engineering was described in the process and it was interesting and meaningful, I, I would vote to accept that paper. I don't know about other reviewers. I mean, that kind of reminds me also of like nine papers in like ACM SIGCHI, right? Or, uh, or ICER. So I, I think there's a place for that, but do I think it's likely to get accepted? Um, I think it's hard. I think there's a reason why there's only been a few papers. Um, 
that actually describe the feature engineering and they usually still uh, sure i think it's a great idea for journal they usually yeah. still go ahead i was just going to say i would submit there and also when i presented on this edm uh most of the questions about this paper were around how did you develop the features what was your process when you read through the data what is it that you actually did so there certainly seems to be an interest and a curiosity for that process and I don't know, I'd rather live in a world where that dictates whether something's publishable. The fact that there is an interest in how that process works, so. I mean, Vera Machinani and um, Seo Pedro both had papers on this and so did Stefan, but it's worth pointing out that all those papers ultimately in the end said, look, it made our prediction better, right? That's, I think there's a reason why those papers did that. Um, Adriana asks about features that are used in signal processing, like Fourier transforms. I mean, sure. Um, <clears throat> I would say that they that they are easier to think about why they make sense in kind of signal more signal processing ish applications, like say educational video, uh, audio data. But I would go so far as to add that there have been a few papers that have used features inspired by that. I think of some of the papers that Arnon Hershkovitz has done, for example. Um, I mean, yeah, hey, you know, those features, if you can get good stuff out of them, more power to you. Irene has a good point. And I would say that actually, um, oh, I'll type it in, Hershkovitz. Irene points out, um, the time series analysis features could do. That also reminds me a little bit of some of the work on using entropy and uh, things like entropy by Erica Snow and Sweet San Pedro a few years ago. Laura Allen, I think also. Uh, so there's been some dynamic time warping stuff too, which is starting to get to a bit of a digression, but you do see a few dynamic time warping papers in EDM. I can't remember the authors anymore. All right, well, I think uh, at that point, we may as well move toward wrap up. Uh, thank you, uh, Ryan and, and Stefan for, for a great overview, a great presentation. We'll share the recording of this uh, in, uh, on the website over the next uh, few days once we have that available. Appreciate everybody else for joining and look forward to our next event coming up uh, in September. So take care all and especially Ryan and Stefan. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks everybody.